this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them you may fight the battle well. Verse 19, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck regards to the faith. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, as we have gathered in your name, lifted our needs before you, Lord, sung the praises uh, and worship, Lord, and expected you to be, inhabit those praises. And now as we share this word, we pray that you'll anoint this word with your Holy Ghost power, that it'll go where you want it to go, and that it'll cause what you want it to cause. In Jesus' name, amen. So this was a this was an order. Change your course. Dead ahead through the pitch black night, a captain sees a light on a collision course with his ship. Reaching for the radio, he says, change your course ten degrees east. Change yours ten degrees west, comes the reply. The captain responds, I'm a Navy captain. Change your course, sir. I'm a seaman second class. The next reply comes back. Change your course, sir. The captain is furious. I'm a battleship. I'm not changing course. The man replies, I'm a lighthouse, it's your call. My dad was a wonderful counselor. He was a brilliant man. But I usually didn't ask him for advice unless I couldn't figure out any other way to solve a problem. And I was completely out of options. Then I would go to my dad. And I just knew that he would have the solution, some advice that would work. I knew he would, but I always resisted going to him. I didn't want him to know what kind of problem I was having. I didn't want him to know how much trouble I was in. I never got in a whole lot of trouble. But I didn't want to admit that I couldn't find my own way out of it. I really wasn't in that much trouble. I just thought I was. Ever been like that? Ever been that way? John chapter 6, starting with verse 14. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Verse 15, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Picture that. Jesus is on the mountain. There's no one else there. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. He's on the mountain, they're in the boat. A strong, a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had towed, rowed about three miles or four, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. Now you wonder why they would be frightened. But there was a storm, mist and waves, and they probably saw a figure, but didn't really know that it was him just yet. So they were afraid, what is this coming our way that we can see kind of through the waves and the wind and the mist? But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. They needed to know that Jesus was on the way. We need to know that, don't we? They were willing to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. So observe that Jesus had just fed the 5,000. The disciples struck out on the lake for Capernaum. The disciples were, were without Jesus, or so they thought. A storm came up, wind and waves, danger, a threat. 
But Jesus saw them in Mark 6, 48. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. He saw them from the mountaintop. As he approached them walking on the water, they were afraid. He said, it's I, don't be afraid. And they were willing to take him into the boat. Immediately they reached the shore. You have experienced a miracle, even bigger than the feeding of 5,000. If you are a born again believer, you've already been healed from the sickness of sin, which is the worst, deadliest sickness that you can have. And we all start out that way. My button is working. Physical illness can kill your body and put you in the grave. But sin, sickness makes you dead to God. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Sin results in death, spiritual death or eternal separation from God. But Jesus is good to save. Suffered and died to pay our penalty which was a death penalty brought about by our own sin the people on the mountain were so impressed by the miracle of feeding 5,000 that they were convinced that he was the Messiah and Jesus knew that they're going to try to force a bleed make him king they didn't know what they were doing and they didn't know what he was doing. If those people were so impressed by the miracle, how much more should we be impressed by the miracle of salvation? The crowd was only fed bread and fish. That's all they got, a meal. We get eternal life. They weren't even looking for eternal life. They were looking for lunch. They, but they were looking for someone anointed by God to set the nation free from the yoke of the Romans. We have been set free from the law of sin and death. There can be no greater freedom. Mindful of what Jesus has done for us, what attitudes should we have? I have several of them here. Number one, be excited. In worship, our excitement should be on display. It should. We should be so excited we can't sit still. If the Steelers win the Super Bowl, we're excited. If you shoot a 10-point buck, you're excited. There is excitement in the telling of the hunt. We have more excited to be to be excited about than any other victory. So our church has is, is become a sit-down church, and that's because we're all old and tired. <laughs> and it's comfortable to sit. And you know, when I first came here, I was used to being a standing through worship and through praise, just standing and people coming down to the front. I was used to that, and I try to get that going here. But then I had to realize, you know, I myself, after standing about 20 minutes, I have to sit down, sore back. So we're all sit down people. But that doesn't mean we're not excited. We come to the front to worship. Maybe if I ask you to, come on down and worship. But after one song, everybody scatters just like the Exodus and goes back to their comfort zone. I can't blame you for that because I have because I have to sit down. So, but heated excitement in worship brings the hand of God to bear in our situation. He inhabits the praises of his people, and those are excited praises. Amen. Number two, go when he sends us. In the account in Matthew and Mark, he made them get in to the boat. In other words, he sent them. He caused them to go out in the lake. He sent them. They were on the way to Capernaum. Do you suppose he sent them into the storm? 
Jesus has places for us to go. He has things for us to do. He opens doors. He will bring you into contact with hurting people. You probably know more people that are without God than you know that, are, that, that know Him. You probably know more unbelievers than you know believers. People your neighbors, people you work with, even people in your family. Number three, know that we are not alone. The disciples thought that because they didn't see him, he wasn't there. They were afraid of what they saw coming until he said, hey, it's me. Don't be afraid. Sometimes it seems like Jesus is not there. Things we're going through. Sometimes it seems like you're standing against, straining against the oars on a, on a storm of life. Sometimes life itself is just a struggle. People of our vintage all know that. We've all been there. Amen. I will never leave you nor forsake you is his message to us. No matter how bleak our situation seems to be, what we see is not the complete picture. No matter how powerful the waves, no matter how battered our boat is, He is there. Believe it. He's there. Number four, there will be storms. There will be storms. Christian life is not perfect. Bad things happen. To good people, to believers, bad things happen. We're under the curse. The apostles were all killed for their faith, except for John. And they did their best to kill him, but it didn't work. If you were born again believer, you have been set free from the law of sin and death. But we're not immune to the effects of the curse. We get tired. We get old. We get sick. We get sad. We get dead. We get poor. Sometimes there's too much month left at the end of our money. The cow dried up. The hen quit laying. Your daughter runs away with a carnival. Trouble happens. We're not immune to trouble. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9. We are hard pressed on every side. Does that sound familiar? I've been there. Hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. So, we want to just say, but, but not crushed. But we don't say the first part of that. We are hard pressed. We are persecuted. We are, we are uh, crushed. We are, we, are, we are struck down, but we're not destroyed. What matters is how, react, how we react to adversity. Job's wife, her suggestion to Job was curse God and die. He didn't do that. No matter how bleak our situation is, you can depend on God to get you through. You can be walking down the street all happy and everything's going fine, and in a day or two later, you can get a bad report from the doctor, and it's downhill from then on. That happens to people. But we can depend on God to get us through. We have to be aware that God answers His way and in His time. He does it the way He wants to do it. We like to order God around, but you can't do that. You can't make demands on God. He's God. Know, number five, that He sees us. Be sure that God sees us, just as He saw for the mountain out into the lake. Be sure that he knows what you're going through. He knows. He knows where it hurts. He knows what makes you sad. He knows what problems you have. He saw them straining at the oars in the storm. He sees you straining in life's storms. Jesus saw the struggling disciples from the mountaintop. They didn't know he could see 
what they were going through. Sometimes we wonder, does God know what I'm struggling with? Doubts help the enemy. Faith keeps us in God's grace and on the path of God's goodness. Number six, don't be afraid. The enemy traffics in fear. He's a fear monger. Causing fear is the ammunition of the enemy. If the enemy can use us, it could cause us to be in fear. He can cripple your effectiveness in serving God. If we're afraid to do what God wants us to do, if we're afraid to tell someone about Jesus, if, we're, if we are to go up to someone and ask if you can pray for them, if we're afraid to get out of our comfort zone, the enemy wins one. I don't want the enemy to win any. I don't want the storm to keep you from the shore. Jesus sent the, apostles, the disciples to Capernaum. That's where he wanted them to be. The storm was in the way. Where is he sending you today? To your neighbor? But Pastor Wood, you don't understand. My neighbor is snarly and difficult. <laughs> I'd rather not deal with him or her. I was snarly and difficult. He's not willing that any should perish. The Apostle Paul thought of himself as the worst of sinners because he persecuted the church. I've told this story before. Matter of fact, I've preached a sermon before. I'm recycling this from 2019, I think. But I was photographing seniors at Lock Haven High School and down in the, I was down in the basement and had my studio set up in the wrestling room. It was kind of gloomy down there. There was a long cement floor hallway down there, light bulbs from the ceiling. It was kind of gloomy down there. And I used to go on the road and I'd, I'd shoot pictures from nine in the morning till nine at night. And then I'd stay in a motel room because I used to go home, but that, it was, I was running off the road. So I'd stay maybe three nights and then I'd go home on the, on the third night and then the next two days I'd just work uh, until five. But So I had gone out to, uh, to have supper and I came back and the next two people didn't show up sitting there at a rickety card table out in the hallway and I put my head down on my hands on the card table and I said I just wish I could go home at this time I was in a backslidden state for three years wasn't going to church wasn't praying no scripture life backslider and the Lord spoke to me and he said you're not ever going home he said, I'm your father, your home is in heaven, but you won't see it if you keep going the way you're going. So I went to my motel room and got on my knees and repented. And he said, I will not strive with you again. This is your last chance. Uh, why am I telling you that? Oh, I know why. There was, a, there was a girl there that I photographed, and she said to me, uh, she said, I'm not buying any pictures because I'm saving my money for a missions trip that we're going on with my youth group at my church. I said, okay, that's cool. And um, that made an impact on me. But the next day, another girl came, and this girl said the same thing. I'm saving my money for a missions trip. Well, I said, was that your friend that was here yesterday? She said, yes, that was my friend, and she said, you should have seen me a month ago. She said, I had black makeup, a razor blade hanging around my neck, and a body full of drugs. And I said, that your friend prayed you into the kingdom. She said, she wouldn't give up on me. She was relentless in inviting me to church. Now, this first girl was just a real plain Jane girl. Just an ordinary, she wasn't the least bit pretty or glamorous just but she had the beauty of holiness in her 
and she would not give up on that. She made that a project. I'm not giving up on this drug-infested girl. And finally, the girl capitulated, went to church, got saved, and they were going to go on a, mercy, on a mission trip together. That's what I actually was aiming to tell you. But that led to me coming back to the Lord. That's not all there is to it, but number seven, be willing to take him into your boat. Know that God loves you. Those aren't just words. God wants to be included in every part of your life. As believers, there are missions that God expects us to do. God saves us individually. He saved you individually. It's not a group effect. You got saved because the Holy Spirit brought conviction and the Word brought you the truth and you capitulated and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen? It's not a group thing just because you belong to a certain church or you're saved and you're on your way to heaven. Not so. Not so. We're saved because Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. We celebrated that with communion. And we individually receive him as Lord and Savior. He's in your boat when you believe. From the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in you, in your spirit. And then he is there to guide you. He is there to direct you. When we say, the Lord told me, or the Lord said thus and such, that's the Holy Spirit prompting the still small voice and impressing us to do or to say something. We need to learn how to listen to that. And sometimes there's an audible voice. It can be startling. I've heard that once or twice, but usually it's an impression in your spirit. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you or impressing you to say or to do something. John 6, 21. Then they were willing to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Verse 28, then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? They were willing to take him into the boat. Some may think, what could God possibly want me to do? Some people would think that. Believe me, there are things that God wants you to do. There's sometimes a struggle, straining at the oars to get forward in what God wants you to do. As a matter of fact, there's always a struggle because you have an enemy, puts things in your path, obstacles. If you think you can't do what God is calling you to do, then you need to be willing to take Jesus into your boat. He saw them from the mountain. He sees you from his high place. He wants to get into your boat. He wants to be in your life. He wants to be in every part of your life. He expects us to be active in sharing our faith. He knows that there will be resistance to that. He knows there will be storms. He knows that the rowing will be a strained rowing. But the reward is awesome. When we get to the shore, you see in your boat, are you excited? Will you go when and where he calls you to go? We're not alone. Know that he is always there. Expect that there will be storms. Know that he sees. Fear not, he's there. We're not really talking about boats today, are we? We're talking about your life. That's your boat. Jesus wants into your life. He wants in all the way. Maybe your life in Him has grown cold. Maybe you need a revival. Maybe you never really committed your life to Him. Well, I know all of you, and I know that's not so. I know you're all born again, committed believers. I know that for a fact. But today's the best day to say, Jesus, come into my boat. I got this problem or that problem. Or I want to be better at sharing my faith. I want to be better at, at the oars. I want to do a better job. 
come into my boat. I invite you to come into my boat, Lord. Would you stand? I know you're all believers, and I know that you know exactly what I'm talking about. And each of you is in a different stage in life. Each of you has different challenges. Each of you has different different responses to what God wants you to do. Some are in a stage where they don't hear. You don't hear if you don't listen. <laughs> in your prayer life, part of your prayer life needs to be when God responds to you. And you need, you know, we, we rattle off a, a list of stuff we want God to do. We say, see you later, Lord, and we disconnect, disconnect. We need to say, we need to be like, like the boy Samuel, say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. We need to be listening. Amen? We need to be listening and be willing to do changes in our life. Sometimes change is frightening, but we just need to be willing to go where God wants us to go, to say what God wants us to say, to speak to people. The Holy Spirit will guide you in that. You know, Casey got in trouble because he didn't, he just was pounding at people with the gospel and that's because he's autistic he doesn't understand if I get to have a tap talk with him I'm going to try to tell him you have to be sensitive to the spirit when you witness everybody isn't ready for that all the time there comes a time when a person is ready to hear the gospel you can tell and then they get saved they do they really do dear Lord we're thankful to you our awesome God for everything that you do for us that we don't even know about, Lord. For the disasters that you kept us even from knowing about. We thank you, Lord, for these precious people in this church. Once again, we lift the ones that aren't here because of illness or whatever. And we just ask you to bless this church. And help us when we have a turn at the oars. Come into our, bo our, our boat. Come in a boat, Lord. We welcome you to come in. We praise and thank you for those opportunities. And we ask you to bless everyone here. Keep us all safe. Till we come together next time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, next Sunday.